So we are going to start the module eight today, which is called uh, Gene to Pathways. And uh, so this work is licensed under a Creative Common uh, license. This means that you are able to copy, share, and modify the work as long as the result is distributed uh, under the same license. So here are our learning objectives. So during this lecture, you will learn how to biologically interpret the gene list derived from various omics experiments, the main concept be behind pathway enrichment analysis and some concept of network visualization. So this module naturally follows module 06 and 07 as both uh, bulk RNA and single cell RNA end up with a list of genes that are differentially expressed and that we would like to functionally interpret. But the concept that we are seeing in this module is very more generic and can be applied to several omics data, like African somatic mutate chip seek microRNA or GWAS data, for example. So this is the course outline that we see that we have three parts. So the first part is going to explain pathway enrichment analysis. Then the second part is going to be about a cytoscape and enrichment map. And then we are going to open it to a more generic information about cytoscape and network visualization to make this transition between module uh, eight and module nine. So let's start uh, the first part, which is pathway enrichment analysis. So, here is the general workflow of pathway and network analysis. And we see that we have uh, three steps. So the first step is the generation of the omics data. So after the alignment um, data to a reference genome and the statistics, we get a list that we would like to functionally interpret. And then during the second step, this is where we use bioinformatic tools to interpret our data. So in order to perform pathway enrichment analysis, what we do is that we query our gene list against biological processes, which are what we call the pathways. But we can, we can also use other sources of information, for example, like drug target, if this is important for our project. And then finally, the third step is where we represent the result that we obtained at step two as a network, because this is easier to interpret. It helps us to elaborate new hypotheses, and it's an opening to future direction in our project. And uh, the next step is to validate the pathway that uh, we found using drug or enzyme inhibitors that can block the pathway of interest. So this is another uh, representation of the analysis workflow. So we see the two main elements that are the gene list and the pathway. So the gene list come from the raw data that we analyzed, normalized, and then uh, we get the gene list. So that's one element. And the other element is the prior knowledge about the function of genes sorry, that are collected and stored in different pathway databases. Oh, sorry, my phone. So the other element is the prior knowledge about the function of the gene that are collected and stored in different um, pathway database. So um, a pathway is a group of genes that are functionally related. So an example of pathway could be the cell cycle. And then in the cell cycle, we know that there are about uh, 500, 500 genes involved. So these two elements, gene list and the pathway, they can talk to each other if we use the, gene, the same gene identifiers. So if the gene list is formatted as gene names, then the format that you need to use in, for the pathway database uh, are also gene names. And if you use ensemble ID in your gene list, then you need to have the pathway database in the ensemble ID. And then the next step when we have these two elements is really to uh, run the pathway enrichment analysis. And we do what we are looking for is over enrichment of the pathway in our gene list. So after this step, then we, we uh, visualize um, the pathway as a network, and we also can add extra layers of information on the top of the network. So sometimes we think that uh, pathway analysis is complicated, but it's actually just a way to organize our gene list in uh, different categories that are biological process. So let's say this is on the left, the gene list that we would like to interpret. 
And then what we can see is that the black genes maybe belong to the axon guidance pathway and then the green genes to aging and the purple to stem cell development and the blue one to cell migration. So what we did now is that we summarize into four pathways. So now we can just concentrate and focus on this four pathway instead of the large gene list and we can generate a new hypothesis based on this four pathway. So uh, we understand here that the need to summarize come from the fact that our gene list is very large and that we got a lot of hits from our mix experiment. If we had a very small uh, gene list, then we may want to interpret it in other ways. So uh, we are querying our gene list again, pathway database that are stored in so pathway that are stored in pathway database. And this element is very important because uh, we need uh, accurate and comprehensive information to use it for a fine interpretation of the data. So um, accurate information entered in a pathway database is very often due to the manual curation of scientists whose tasks are to read the various paper uh, and um, they enter the information in the database. And although now some uh, text mining method are being developed. So one of the largest database is the gene ontology or GO. And GO is divided into three categories, which are cellular component, molecular function, and biological process. So when we do pathway enrichment analysis, we are more interested by the third one, the biological process. And we can see here, for example, like um, the different stages, stages of cell division. So one thing to know about the GO structure is that it's organized in a hierarchical um, structure. So they are parent and child terms. <clears throat> so the parent terms are very generic pathway and they contain a lot of genes. So for example, could be biological process and cellular process. <clears throat> Sorry. And then the, the smaller uh, gene sets so the smaller pathway that are more uh, specific, the child terms, they contain less genes, and but they're also more informative. So we can see here example. So we have B cell apoptosis, so it doesn't contain a lot of genes, and we see that B cell apoptosis is a is part of apoptosis. So we can see here that apoptosis is like a more general term compared to B cell apoptosis. And then apoptosis is, uh, is part of program cell death, which is part of cell death. So um, in our pathway analysis workflow, what we do is that uh, we usually set a threshold to about 500 or 1,000 genes per pathway. And we do that to kind of eliminate this very large pathway that are um, very generic and not very informative. So another database is Reactum, and uh, Robin is going to present it in module nine. So um, the strategy that we apply in our workflow is to use uh, multiple, multiple databases together when we perform pathway enrichment analysis to get the most comprehensive and precise information of the pathway that uh, can be contained in our gene list. So, uh, so this beta lab uh, GMT file, as we call it, is available and updated each month. So it's uh, publicly available because we use it uh, for publications and everyone is welcome to, to use it if they wish to. So here is the presentation of our standard workflow for pathway uh, enrichment analysis. So we have basically one workflow uh, for defined gene list. So a defined gene list would typically contains a fixed number of genes, for example, 200 or 500 genes that we have uh, selected using a threshold. So um, an example of a such a list, list uh, uh, such, such a gene list would be a list of genes that were found frequently mutated in a set of patients. And then we have a ranked uh, gene list so a rank list is a list of all genes in the genome that uh, we were able to rank using a score that is coming out from the omics experiment. So a typical example, for example, would be uh, RNA-seq data where we have two groups and then we, we compare control and treated. 
and we can rank all genes using the differential expression score from top up regulated to top down regulated genes. So um, we have um, two different protocols because the statistical test is going to be different if we use a defined gene list or ranked gene list. So um, because of that, we use two different tools to perform pathway enrichment analysis. And then for a gene list, the tool that we are going to use is G-Profiler. And then for a rank list, the tool that we are going to use is G GSE. But both two kind of uh, generate a similar output table that contains the list of the pathway that we are tested with a p-value um, that estimates the probability that this pathway is enriched in our data by chance only. So on this table here that presents the pathway that were significantly enriched in our, um, in our data, uh, what happens is that this pathway can be related to each other. They can have a similar function and they can share genes in common and we don't see it uh, in the table. So what we do is what, that we use the, the um, cytoscape enrichment map to create a network of this pathway. And then the pathway that are related to each other, they will form a cluster. So then we can uh, identify the main, main functions that were enriched in our genlets. So we say that uh, we have two possible uh, kind of gene list, the defined gene list and the ranked gene list. So the question we are going to ask when doing enrichment analysis would be um, slightly different in each case. So if we, for a defined gene list, the question that we are going to ask is, are any pathway surprisingly enriched in my gene list? And if we have a ranked gene list, then the question is going to be, are any pathway ranked surprisingly high or low in my ranked uh, list of genes? So for the defined gene list, then the statistical test is going to be a Fisher's exact test. And for a ranked list, the statistical test is going to be a modi modified kolmogorov smirnov test included in the GATA tool. So then we are going to start by explaining Veronica, the different. Veronica, can may I ask you a question? Can yes. you define uh, this Q value? What, what, what is a Q value? Yes, uh, so uh, the Q value is the corrected uh, um, p-value after, um, because we correct for multiple hypothesis testing, and we are going to see it in details in the next part of the section. So we are going to first to explain the features exact test and the GAC, and then I'm going to explain the, the q-value. Um, so let's start with the, um, the features exact test and the defined gene list. So this slide illustrates the important concept of overlap that is used to calculate um, the enrichment score, which is, I would say, the first step of the, the pathway enrichment analysis. So here on the left, we have our gene list, and our gene list contains 41 genes. And then we have the pathway that we are testing, which is called axon guidance and, and is coming from the gene ontology database. And this pathway contains 39 genes. So what we see here is that we have 13 genes that are overlapping between my gene list and my pathway. So this 13 is my overlap size. So this is my enrichment score. And what we see here, what we can estimate is that 13 out of 41, it represents about one quarter of my gene list and about one quarter of the testing pathway. And then the next question is going to be, is this overlap significant? Is this overlap large enough to say that the pathway is enriched in my gene list? So how do sample enrichment tests works? So here in brown, this is, um, this all rectangle represents the background. So the experimental background can also be defined as the sum of the experimentally detectable genes. So this is, the background is an important concept when we use the Fisher's exact test. And um, if you have RNA-seq data or other omics data that cover all genes 
in the genome, you don't need to worry about too much about the background because the background represents all genes in the genome. But if you would do a pathway enrichment analysis from a custom array or nano string array that just have like um, a, a portion of the genome on the array, you need to reduce the background to only the genes that you could measure in your experiment. So for example, if you did an array containing only Im immune genes, then the background are only these immune genes that you place on the array. And the, the gene list will be only the genes from these immune genes that are differentially expressed. So the first step is to calculate the overlap between your gene list and the pathway. So we said uh, during the previous slide that this overlap was 30. And then the next question is, is this overlap as large or larger than expected by chance? So how to calculate that? So the question here uh, will be answered by a p-value. And the p-value is going to assess the probability that uh, this overlap is uh, due to random chance only. So uh, what you can do here to solve this issue, you could do random permutation. So what you could do is to use random gene list, which are the same size of your gene list, but with random genes, and you do it 1,000 times. So each time you have a random list, you calculate the overlap between your random list and your pathway. And this way you, uh, you build your null distribution. And then you compare your observed overlap to your null distribution to see if, this, if your overlap is larger than the null distribution. And what you can do is to calculate an empirical p-value by calculating, calculating the number of times that your observed overlap was larger than the random overlap. And then, so the p-value that you get, assessing the probability that this pathway is enriched by uh, your gene list by chance. So a p-value can range from zero to one. So if you have a p-value equal to zero, it means that there is zero change that the results are caused by random chance, and you can be confident to report the pathway as enriched. And if it's one, then it's 100% chance to be random. So zero is good and one is bad. Uh, the problem with uh, permutation is that it can be time and resource co uh, consuming for the computer. And luckily, under some condition, we know that the distribution of the random samples looks like. And in this case, uh, we don't have to do this random permutation, <clears throat> but we, sorry, we can use a statistical, statistical test. And this is the case for enrichment analysis. We know that the shape of the null dense distribution is a hypergeometric distribution. And then the test that uses this distribution is the Fisher's exact test. Um, so, um, I, could, yes? Could you, um, so for the p value, do we um, use the traditional 0 0.05 as a cutoff or? You, we are going to see that we use FGR 0.05 at the cutoff. So the p-value is the first uh, p-value for one pathway, but because we are going to test many, many pathways, we, we, we will correct for multiple hypothesis testing. And then uh, after the FGR, we are going to select, so the q-value of 0.05 to consider uh, the pathway that are significantly enriched. All right, okay, thank you. Sorry, I just have a question. Yes. Uh, we, your starting gene list, uh, that's derived from your omics data. So is this from stuff like uh, DSeq or Edger where you get differentially expressed uh, genes? Yes. So yeah, so it's a very generic uh, here. So if you have, um, so when you say DSeq and Edger, that will be RNA-seq data. And uh, RNA-seq data, we will rather uh, use the ranked list approach that I'm going to, to explain very soon. So if for the Fisher's exact test is really when you have a gene list that you cannot rank. So it could be a realistic, we just select a threshold and you have like your 500 genes, it could come from chip stick data, it could come uh, from uh, frequently mutated genes. Okay, thank you. And, and we will see uh, like in the practical lab number one, uh, I took um, single cell RNA from 
Gravier and I extracted define GeoList and I used GeoProfiler and the features exactly in, in this case. I'm going to explain it during the lab. Okay. So the features exact test is better understood uh, with uh, red balls and black balls. And uh, if you want uh, like trivial, you can uh, imagine that also they are MNMs. So, uh, so we have uh, 5,000 genes that are totally and only 500 are black. And uh, we can say that the black gene represent one biological pathway. So uh, now we do one random draw and what we get is four black balls and one red genes. So we know intuitively that it's not easy to get four black genes when we do, when we do one um, draw because we have many more red genes that in, the, in, in, the, in the box. So um, now we want to calculate a p-value associated with this result. So what we can do is that we use the hypergeometric distribution to build the null, uh, I put the null that distribution, and then we can calculate the p-value associated um, with this result, uh, the four um, black gene and one red gene. And what we get is a p-value of 0 0.001, and it's very close to zero. It means that the, sh the, the chance uh, to make type, a type one error is extremely low, 0.1%. So we can conclude that this black pathway is significantly enriched in our gene list and it's probably uh, not due but to chance only. So on the left side, this is the formula of the hypergeometric probability density function. And uh, this is what, what is used to calculate the null distribution. But what I want to show here is the value inside the formula. So we have M, X, T, and K. And uh, those number come uh, from here. So M is going to be the size of the pathway. Uh, K is going to be the size of the gene list. X is going to be the overlap between the pathway and the gene list, and the um, T is going to be the background. So that's why we say that for defined gene list and Fisher exact test, the concept of the background in, is important because you can see that T is in the formula, so that's going to change the p-value. So, uh, so those numbers, you also can put them in the uh, in two by two contingency table. And I'm showing it to you in, uh, in case you have one pathway that you would like to test um, in your, with your data. And then in this case, you just can use R and then you can use the Fisher's exact test formula by enter this number. So you, you enter this, this X, this K, this T and this M, and then you can test one one pathway of interest manually, I would say. So, so G-Profiler is the web-based tool that we are trying in the practical lab and that uses a Fisher's exact test to calculate the pathway enrichment in from a, a defined gene list. So we can see here the output table. So the output table would be a list of pathways. And we can see here that they're all coming from the gene ontology database and then TQ and U are the, are the, the same as the, the K, M, and T that I just show you. So T term is the pathway. So here we have a pathway um, that um, the original size of the pathway was 17. And the original size of the gene list, Q for query, was a 20. And then in this case, we had an overlap of five genes between the pathway and our query gene list. And the background, the universe, the background was about 70,000 genes. So all these four numbers were entered in the formula of the Fisher's exact test. And then we got a p-value. And then this p-value was corrected for multiple hypothesis testing. And we have here the adjusted p-value. And we are going to select the pathway that are, have at least an FGR or P adjusted value uh, less than 0 0.05. Okay, so that was for the defined gene list. 
But now we are going to speak about the second statistical test to perform pathway enrichment analysis using a rank list. So a rank list, uh, I would say it's really typically, uh, I use it typically for when I have um, bulk rna seq data and uh, to class design when I, con when I compare control and treated sample. So this is the first matrix where we have the, the samples for the control and the samples for the treated. And then we use our packages like uh, HR or DSIC2 to estimate the differential expression of the genes. And what we are going to, to do is using this uh, DSIC2 and uh, HR output, we are going to calculate a score. And this score will enable us to rank the genes from up-regulated in treated versus control to down-regulated in treated versus control. And we would um, leave the genes that are non-significantly non differentially expressed in the middle. So we don't remove any genes. Um, so in order to do that, so we take the DSC or HR output, and then in this head output, we look at two columns. One is the log fold change, the other is the p-value. So not the corrected p-value, but the nominal p-value. And then, for example, these genes had a log fold change of plus uh, 3.4, and um, it's very low p-value. And then we use this formula here. So we calculate the score here, we, we say equal, Sign, log for uh, sign of the log for change multiplied by minus log 10 of the p-value. So sign of the log for change here, that, for, that just for the direction. We just want to extract uh, the direction to see if this genes is up-regulated or down-regulated. So if the log for change for this gene was plus 3.4, then the sign of the log for change is going to be plus one. And then the p-value, so the minus log 10 will just transform a very a small p-value close to zero to a high score because a very small p-value is a very significant p-value. So then, so this one is the top gene, so it's getting the highest score of 32. So then this way, with this value, we make the genes from top up regulated to top down regulated with the non-significant genes in the middle, and we don't remove them. So Ronnie. you can, yes. Sorry, there's a question that Jose had in Slack. Um, yes. Is it possible to use Cytoscape to analyze exome data? Um, I don't know. Sorry, I don't know. Um, we'll look into this then. Yeah, so, 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 so this first step of the pathway enrichment analysis, so we are going to, to, to get you to Cytoscape, but this uh, first step is is done outside uh, Cytoscape. So actually this module is two parts. It's really the pathway enrichment analysis that we calculate when we get the gene list and it's outside GSEA, uh, it's outside Cytoscape. So we use GeoProfiler and GSEA. Some Cytoscape apps can do the, the pathway enrichment map, but Cytoscape is really like the downstream after we got the pathway enrichment result to visualize the results. So then maybe we can go back to this uh, question later. So, um, so, okay, so we have this formula. So you can calculate this formula in R is better because we don't want to, to mess up with the dates in Excel, but you also can do uh, it in Excel. Just be careful that your gene names are not going to be uh, transformed into date by, by Excel. Excuse okay, so me. now we, yes. Where is the rank score coming from? Is it something that you define in your project or is it something that so people the use? Formula? Yeah. The, so who, who, who found the formula, if you want? Yeah. Um, I think uh, it's really, um, we tried uh, so several things and then the lock for change. Some people, they tend to rank it by the log for change, but the log for change is not very precise because the log for change doesn't take into account uh, reproducibility or standard deviation within your groups, but the p-value is really a refraction of the difference in, in the average between two groups and the reproducibility within uh, two groups. So it's really more accurate to use the p-value and it's very standard in bioinformatics to use minus log 10 of a p-value 
to, to get a score because it's really uh, easier to handle a score compared to this very mm -hmm. small p-value. So that's why yeah. um, that's the it's way. Ju just use both of the p-value and log functions, maybe. This is the formula. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, we use the p-value. That's what we recommend. Uh, depending on the project, sometimes I do different things. Like I do a log for change my, my multiplied by minus of ten of p-value. So I would say it's sometimes it's case by case. You what what is what you need to, to to look is that your ranking is re reflects very well what's going on in your data. Yeah. So that you look at your data, you you look at your matrix, and then you look at the ranking. And if, for example, you can do a heat map of your matrix and then the ranking, and you see that there is like a very nice uh, logical uh, ranking from, from genes that you think are really upregulated to downregulated. And you, you. you can depend on the data. So just a question. So why are we using P values yeah. instead of the P adjusted values? Yes, uh, yeah, that's a very good question. Is because here we don't select genes, you know, and the corrected P value, we correct for multiple hypotheses is to select a group of genes or a group of pathway. But here we don't select, we just keep them. So we don't need to correct for that. And the p-value is um, has less ties. So when you look at FDR value, sometimes the way it's calculated, that gives you ties. And ties are not good for ranking. So, um, so basically here, it's, um, it's just the ranking that we need. And right, the p-value is going to be more precise. Rani, can I ask you a question? Yes, sure. Uh, so uh, with the p-value, uh, like in just regular observational studies, like epidemiological studies, we notice that an increase in sample size will give you a, a, a significant p-value. Um, and so let's say if you have a smaller sample size and if you want to see a difference, then the, if something like p-hacking, yes. uh, does that concept also apply here? Do yes. you think uh, like the p-values could change in relation to the sample size or? Yes, I mean, so that, for me, I would call it the biological replicates. Yeah. So, so okay. the, more, the more biological replicates you have per group, the more precise the, the p-value is going to be. So in our case, it's not, like it's, it's, it's good. The more, the more biological replicates you have, the more sensitive your p-value is going to be. And, and we see it. And uh, sometimes uh, we, we try with three biological replicates, maybe for RNA seq, we could be for chip seq. And, and we don't get like, a, we, we cannot separate the signal from the background noise. So then we add biological replicates. We don't change anything. We just add biological replicates. Mm -hmm. And then we can see, uh, now we can, we are able to extract the, the signal from the background noise. And in that case, do you notice a difference in the in the ranking score? Like the ranking order stays the same, yes. or does that does no, that no. change? Well, the ranking is is going to change, but usually for the best. Okay, okay. So, uh, is there a way to um, to maybe during the break time? But I was just wondering if there's a way to uh, calculate the sample size to make sure that we are getting the right p value. Uh, there is some analysis, like power mm -hmm. analysis. So right. basically, pilot, um, people do a pilot experiment. So we okay. do it when we think that we have uh, like noisy data in terms mm -hmm. of variation between the samples or that the signal is a bit low. And then you, from that pilot experiment, then you can use statistical uh, tools to, to predict if it's going to be enough or not. Okay. Thank you, Veronica. Thank you. Uh, we have another question uh, in the Slack from a student. So um, okay. Sneha has asked, um, a gene can be present in more than one pathway. Um, how is that accounted for in the overrepresentation test? Um, if it isn't accounted for in the overrepresentation test, how, how can we account for that? And so, they both had a follow-up question. Um, sorry. Uh, maybe is there a minimum? Time. Uh, sure, okay. sure. So, uh, so, so, so the gene redundancy uh, problem is, is, 
is real and many pathways have, uh, have genes in common. And so, uh, and it's sort of weakness of the pathway enrichment analysis because um, we have this with gene um, redundancy, but the, the way we, we deal with this is, is by using enrichment method, I'm going to explain. So basically, at the first step, we, we test pathway one by one as they would be independent. And then, um, then we have this table with um, enrichment results where we have all the pathway and sometimes sometimes they contain pathway uh, genes in common. And then we use uh, enrichment map to to cluster this this pathway. And then the pathway that are really related with a lot of genes in common now they are going to be considered as just one cluster instead of ten pathways. So we try to reduce the dimension like that. But in fact, in the in the in the statistical test, we we say that they are independent, but they're not they're not quite independent because a pathway A, if a pathway A is significantly enriched and a pathway B with many genes in common uh, is enriched, then uh, they are not quite independent because we know that if A is enriched, then B is enriched. So that's based on the statistical test. But in in, in practical terms, we deal it with by using enrichment map that, that will uh, cluster the this pathway that are, have genes in common. Uh, so what was the follow-up question? Okay, um, the next question was, is there a minimum and maximum number of genes that can be used in an over-representation analysis? So for a defined genome list, I would say um, minimum would be 50 and um, maximum would be maybe 500 or 1000 is really big already. So 500, but for a rank list, if you can rank your, your list, then there is no threshold. We try to avoid threshold. So and you just put all the genes in the genomes. So that's why we recommend rank list whenever you, whenever you can. Um, just a follow up for me. Why, why do you set that threshold to 50 and um, 500? Uh, uh, so it's a bit, for the it, it, it's a bit arbitrary. Uh, it's just that if you have less than 50 genes, then you really don't need to, to do pathway enrichment analysis because you almost can analyze your gene list by, by eyes only. So really pathway analysis is to summarize your results. And 500 and 1000, you are going to have uh, tons of pathways and um, you, you, you can do that. But what you are going to do is to, uh, you are going to look at the top the top pathways anyway. So if you have more than 501,000 uh, genes, so for example, in G-Profiler, you can use the ordered query option that would just order the genes and consider the, the top ones are on the most significant. So, I mean, you can try 1,000. There is no problem with G-Profiler in terms of statistics, but it's the how you are going to interpret it. Are, are you going to be overwhelmed or not? And again, if you have like a long gene list like this, try to see if you can use a rank list. Thank you. So, um, so for GSEA, so we, we run path analysis, but here in this case, so we have two direction. Yeah, we have the, the, the pathway enriched in uh, at the top of the list, and we have the pathway enriched at the bottom of the list. So the we're going to have like the p-value for all the pathway, but also uh, the sign of the enrichment score. So a positive enrichment score would be a pathway significantly enriching my uh, up um, my upregulated genes, and then a negative enrichment enrichment score are going to be the pathway enriched in my downregulated genes. So it's Muta and at all who just developed GSEA in 2003. They were studying diabetes and they came out with this um, GSEA algorithm that showed that the, the down, re down regulation of this pathway oxidative phosphorylation. And what was interesting is that if they looked individually in the, in, at the genes of the oxidative phosphorylation, not, not, none of these genes were significantly downregulated. But then when they calculated like the, the addition of the small amount of the, the genes uh, in the oxidative phosphorylation, phosphorylation pathway, they found that this pathway was actually strongly affected and GACA could capture that and it was uh, further validated. So, um, so now we are going to see how the GACA running sum 
uh, is calculated. So on the left, we have the rank file, which is upregulated uh, at the top and downregulated genes at the bottom. So this rank file replaces it horizontally with the up gene on the left and the down gene on the right. So the genes that are not significant, they stay here in the middle and they do not contribute to the enrichment score. So then the black uh, bars are genes in the pathway that we are testing. So what we can see here is that we have a higher density of the genes uh, on the left side, which are the upregulated genes. So it means that this pathway is enriched in our upregulated genes. So the GHCA running sums <coughs> stop at zero at, at gene one, and then you go by uh, gene by gene, and the reading sum is going to increase each time there is a gene that is in the tested pathway. So then you have to have a lot of genes in the tested pathway at the beginning of your rank list to have uh, like a sharp increase in the running sum. And then it's going to decrease because you don't have that many uh, genes in the pathway. And then the maximum here is what we call the enrichment score. So the GAC enrichment score. And then GAT has a weight system that gives you, um, that's going to give more weight to the genes that are um, at the two extreme of the rank file. So at the left for the very, very top upregulated genes and the very, very downregulated genes. So you cannot have a peak in the middle. So then you can have uh, pathways like this. This is the name of this pathway that is enriched in genes upregulated in my data. So in this case, I have a positive enrichment score. And you also have pathways, so this is the name of the other pathway, that are enriched in genes downregulated. In this case, you're going to have a negative enrichment score. So uh, now that we have calculated the enrichment score, we still need to estimate um, that um, the enrichment score that we got is um, equal or larger than the one that we could have obtained uh, by random chance only. So GACA method is using permutation to build a null distribution and to calculate an empirical p-value. So for each tested pathway, we have the observed enrichment score. And then we see if it's far away from the mean of the null distribution that could should be equal to zero because this is random. And so we can calculate, uh, GAC is calculating an empirical p-value by calculating the number of times the observed score was larger than the random scores. Okay, so then the same as the G profiler, then we have an enrichment score and then we have a p-value. So, uh, so as a summary, if you have a defined gene list, like 200, 500 genes, then using a, you are using a tool that um, is using the Fisher's exact test. But if you have RNA-seq to class design, you try to rank your gene list uh, to avoid arbitrary threshold. And then in this case, uh, you can use the GACA tool. So now we is are me? going, yes, sure. I, I, I just confused in the, beginning the Fisher test, we had two different groups, those genes that were in our pathway and the other was our uh, those genes that we are interested in. And for the second one that we have this um, rank gene list, we have a group of genes that we are interested in, but uh, instead of having just the gene list, we have the ranks for those genes based on, for example, gene expression level Yes. And then uh, where do we use those uh, genes in our exact pathway in the formula? I, I don't understand that. Um, that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, so for the features exact test, you understand, yeah? You have like um, selected genes of interest. So for NS6, you, you use your top one and that's it, yeah? But for GACA, you, you need, um, you need a two class design, treated versus control, yes? And then you are interested by the genes. So you have two classes for GAC, control, so treated, control. And you are interested in the genes that are higher expressed in your treated versus control. You also are interested in your genes that are downregulated in your treated and your control. So but we don't have you, any, uh, any, set of genes that are in our pathway 
analysis. We don't have any gene lists that are, for example, belonging to a specific pathway. Yes, yes. So GSCA is going to, so this is a pathway, yeah? So in the, so you see my slide? So in the pathway database, we have maybe 5,000 pathways. So the pathway, for example, cell cycle, we know 500 genes in this pathway. So then GHC is going to look for this pathway, cell cycle, how many genes, if you want, are in the up regulated genes that are at the top of the list. And then for another pathway, maybe the pathway for apoptosis is going to be enriched in genes down regulated in my list. So if I have pathway that contains a lot mm -hmm. of genes upregulated and pathway that contains a uh, um, genes that are downregulated. But would you go to this next slide? And next, but in these figures, yeah. we don't use the pathway data. We are just using the upregulated and downregulated so, score so, for those genes so, that so. we have in our list. So that's the list. And for example, this one signaling by FGFR1 comes from the pathway database that we are testing. So you are going to have a plot for each pathway for the 5,000 pathways that are in the database. So those black bars are the genes that are in this pathway. And okay, this okay. one so also antigen processing is a pathway that is in the pathway database. And okay, so, so all the genes from uh, all the genes are uh, in order in our X values, but those black ones are genes that we have in our specific list. So, so when you pick about gene list, those are the rank file is the gene list, and then you have one element which is the gene list, and the other element is the pathway. And then you just try to see the genes in the pathway that I'm testing. Where where are they? Are they in the upregulated genes that I have for my gene list for my data, or in the downregulated gene list? Yeah, I got it. Thank you. So now we had uh, a few questions about the 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 the, the Q value. Uh, and then, and that's true that the Q value is very important. And uh, so, so far, what I've shown you is one pathway. So, so th those examples that I was showing to you are just one pathway. So we tested one pathway at a time, but a real in reality, we are testing many pathway at the same time, and we are basically testing all the pathway that are in the pathway database. So we are testing all the pathway in the pathway database that are and see how they overlap with my gene list. Therefore, because we are trying to test as many pathways as possible, we also need to correct for multiple hypothesis testing. So here, um, this slide is going to explain the concept behind multiple hypothesis testing. So we are going back to um, our example of red and black genes, and we had 5,000 genes containing 500 uh, black genes, and the result that we hope to get is at least uh, four black genes. So the p-value was telling us that we only had 0 0.01 chance uh, to get this result by a random chance only. But this is only if we do one trial, because if we try and try again until we succeed, maybe 10,000 times at one point we we'll get um, the result of four black genes and one red, ge one red gene. So even it's not likely. So even if it's not likely to get the result the first time, uh, it become more and more possible when we try multiple times. So even if an event is unlikely, if we try it multiple times, we may able to get it. And that's what people mean by uh, multiple hypothesis testing. And that's what we need to correct for the number of tests that we are making. So if we would not correct for multiple hypothesis testing, we would generate a high rate of type one error, also named uh, false positive. So we need to correct for the number of pathway that we have tested. So um, there is actually a simple way to correct for multiple tests and intuitively we could 
think about it um, ourselves that we just um, multiply the nominal p value, so the first p value that we obtained, by uh, the number uh, of pathways that we have tested. And so in this case, like the, the corrected p value uh, is always higher than the, the original p value. So if you have, have an original p value of 0.1, one, maybe at the, after the correction, your p-value is going to be 0 0.05. So this correction is known uh, uh, as the Bonferroni correction, and it's very stringent. So it could be that if you use this Bonferroni correction, that you won't have a lot of pathway uh, that pass the, 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 the corrected p-value threshold of 0 0.05. So then there is another method that is widely used, and it's called the false discovery rate. So the false for discovery rate is the expected proportion of the observed enrichment due to random chance only. So, so let's say we run the pathway enrichment analysis, we get the p-value, and then we get the corrected p-value. In this case, for the FDR, it's called a q-value. Then we select the pathway that have an, a q-value under 0 0.05. And what we, we say is that at the 0 0.05 threshold, we expect a proportion of 5% of this selected pathway to be due to random chance. So the, the main method to calculate the FGR is called the benjamin holberg uh, method. And uh, so the result is called, some, we sometimes we call the FGR, but uh, it's the FGR Q value. So, um, so because the number of tests uh, of the pathways included in the equation to calculate the FGR, the more pathway we are testing, so if we are testing like 10,000 pathway, uh, then the more or the higher the p-value is going to be corrected. So one way to de decrease the stringency of the correction is to limit the number of tests that we are making. So that's why, for example, in GSEA, when we are applying our protocol, we also remove the like the small um, the small pathway that are contain less than ten genes and the pathway that contains more uh, more than five hundred and one thousand genes. So so we remove them sometimes because they are the large pathway are not informative, but it also uh, reduce the, the number of pathway that we are testing. So we don't have to correct uh, so much the p-value. Okay, so, so, so that's the end of the pathway enrichment analysis, which is basically, um, so take the gene list as a rank list to avoid arbitrary threshold, or just take take the, the 500 genes that we want to interpret and then see which pathways are overlapping uh, with our gene list. But then when we have these tables, then we use a cytoscape enrichment map to visualize the results. And, um, and this is the, the, the question I answered uh, already is why we are doing it is because we get this very, very long table with many, many pathway enrich. But actually, in these pathways, some are related. So some share um, very, very uh, similar biological uh, function and genes in common. And uh, this is the reason is that the pathway database are redundant, and also because we like to start with a very large number of pathway in database to get very precise information. So um, to, to address this issue, then enrichment map was uh, developed. And then uh, in enrichment map, so we are going to create a network and a pathway is going to be what we call a node. So each, all the pathway that pass the FDR 0 0.05 would be a node in the enrichment map. And if maybe pathway 4, 10, 15, 20 share a lot of genes in common because they share uh, the same biological function, they are going to be connected by lines that we called edges. And so then this pathway that were here somewhere in the database, now they will form a cluster on the map that we will be able to see. Then uh, on this big table, then maybe we have like here 50 pathway, but after the, the, the visualization you're using enrichment map, then maybe, um, maybe five be summarized by five biological function. 
So this is what I said, that the goal is to address, the, the goal of enrichment math is to address the redundancy uh, problem. So that's what I just explained to you. So uh, enrichment map is a cytoscape app that is compatible with many enrichment tools in the generic format, as long as the output table at the pathway name, the p-value and the genes included in each pathway. And uh, in the practical lab, we are going to use enrichment map with the GACA tool and the G-Profile tool. And then one advantage of enrichment map is that we can uh, upload more than one data set. So if you have different time points or if you have different conditions, then you do your pathway and enrichment map independently, but then you can visualize, uh, you, you do your pathway enrichment independently and then you can upload them together on the same map. So uh, if you create an enrichment map um, with uh, the GSEA output, then you will have a pathway that are enriched in your up regulated genes. There will be red nodes uh, on the map and you will, you will uh, also have pathway enriched in genes that are uh, in pathway enriched in your genes that are downregulated. So in this case, you have uh, blue nodes. So red is pathway enriched upregulated genes and blue is pathway and rich in genes that are downregulated. So we have seen that if two pathways are uh, connected by um, a significant amount of genes in common, they are going to be connected by lines, but um, we use an overlap coefficient score to calculate how many edges or lines we display on the map because if two pathways would be connected if they share at least one gene in common, then there would be too many connections and the network uh, would, would look like, like, like a hairball. So this is an example of an enrichment map created with the GACA results. So those each node, again, are pathway that are enriched, meaning contain, they, they contain a lot of uh, genes downregulated uh, in my experiment. And those red nodes are the pathway that contain a lot of genes that are upregulated in my experiment. And then so the enrichment map is doing this, this, this clustering. And then we use another map called ATO annotate to uh, draw these circles around the cluster and to ATO annotate uh, the, the cluster by using the three top uh, words that are included in the names of the pathways. And then when you prepare your uh, figure for publication, then you can further edit the labels. So this is a map that we call publication ready. So we have annotated our cluster. We made sure that the, 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 the cluster do not overlap. And then uh, we removed uh, the label of the pathway using uh, an option called uh, publication ready. And when we do a figure, we manually, let's say, add a legend to, um, to notify what the nodes and edges are. So another feature of enrichment map is that uh, we can add an additional gene set to the map. So those um, pathways are the result of uh, pathway enrichment on gene expression. But in addition to that, we uh, uh, added microRNA targets to the map. And then uh, we can see here that the microRNA targets were uh, mostly overlapping or contained in the focal adhesion pathway. So uh, a network uh, visualization uh, has the advantage to be able to to add different layers of information. So if the, your enrichment map is too busy because you had a lot of pathway that were enriched in your data, uh, there's also an option to collapse the network so that now each cluster that contained uh, a lot of pathway are now represented as one node. So this is an example of an enrichment map that uh, were created using single cell RNA. So here we see the TSNI plot of the single cell RNA with the different clusters. And then what they did is 
they took um, different clusters of interest and then they run a pathway and, and uh, enrichment analysis on the individual cluster and then they create an individual uh, enrichment map for each of these cluster and then we are going to do something uh, similar in the particular collab number one. So the steps were cluster identification, then enrichment analysis in each of the cluster, and then uh, enrichment map. So this is the enrichment map that I found very nice in terms of design and content and that uh, we show a lot as example. And the data were copy number variant in autism. And uh, this uh, map um, show the relationship between pathway and reach, so in CNV deletions, uh, which are here on, so this red and the pink no node are the pathway and reach in genes that they found uh, having uh, a deletions. And what is interesting is that they merge this map with another source of information that were genes and pathway um, known to be related to autism so that's well that was prior knowledge and genes known to be related to autism and into intellectual disability so what we can see here is that they could see uh, some pathway in common between this known gene and the, the pathway that were coming directly from their experiment and then they really um, made a good use of the visual style because when uh, when we lay, uh, when we overlay different information uh, on the network, then we can use different uh, visual styles to, to make this uh, clear and obvious. So here they put like the red and the pink for their data and then the, the yellow for the prior knowledge. And they also play with the shape of the nodes and they also play with the color of the edges. So the tips for a publishable uh, enrichment map. So, um, so first you get your map and then you try to uh, avoid um, like a, a map that is too big, that would be too busy. So you make it clear, you, you move your cluster apart and then you, um, you annotate your cluster and then you edit the auto annotation. You, so you play with the connectivity parameters, dense or sparse to make it, to make sure that the map is clear. And then um, you play with the visual style, color and shapes of the nodes. And then when you are ready, you can export this image as PDF and polish the last details using a graphic editor. Uh, so now we are going to uh, to start the last section, which is not going to be um, a lot of slides, but that's going to be uh, opening on a module nine um, with Robin. So we are going to talk more generally about the Cytoscape software that we use for enrichment map, and also about the advantages of network and uh, visualization. And Robin uh, will go more in details. So Cytoscape is a standalone application, it's open source and free, and this is a collaborative project involving multiple groups. So um, when we introduce Cytoscape and network visualization, we usually start by explaining the concept of interconnectivity. So interconnectivity is defined as how two or more things or people are connected to each other. So this concept was first described for social network and with the idea that there is a maximum of six degrees of separation between two people using a, a friend of a friend uh, chain. So, and then the, the, the number of steps that separate uh, two people is called the social distance. So the, so, the first uh, software to build a net, networks, Giphy, was done for social networks based on graph theory model. But in life, uh, we can build a lot of different types of network because a lot of things are interconnected and they are connected by what they are have in common. So there are similarities and their correlation. And that's why I put this network below, which is uh, soccer players in a team. And this network was done also with um, Cytoscape. And so what uh, they did they put the, the node as each soccer player of the team? And if there is a large no, no, node, 
is because uh, during the game, the, the, the soccer player received and passed a lot uh, the, the, the soccer ball uh, during the game. So, um, so basically this is two different types of network, but Cytoscape was mainly developed uh, um, with the aim to create network related to biological questions and to find and visualize relationships uh, between biological entities that we are studying, which are genes, proteins, metabolites, or pathways. So uh, why would we use network visualization for biological data? This is because we want to discover and represent the relationships that are present in our data. So we usually re receive our data in, in a very, very long table or Excel spreadsheet. And this table, they, 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 they might contain a relationship between the data points in the table, but we can't see them. But when uh, a network is created, it's usually very easy to detect pattern with our eyes only. So in order to understand a network, there are two terms to learn, and this is NOD and H. And we have already seen, uh, seen it with the enrichment map, so where a node was a pathway and uh, the age was the genes in common between pathway. But we can have multiple types of network, and we also can have uh, networks where a node is a gene or a protein. And then, the, the, so the age is going to represent the, the relationship between these two genes or proteins. So if it's a protein, the edges can represent the proteins that are expressed or known to physically interact with each other. So for each network, we need to understand what the nodes are and what the edges are before, um, before trying to interpret the results. Ready? So as a yeah, question maybe? There's a really good question in- They're in all good. The all the questions are good. Fair, very fair. Um, so Ariana asked, um, as she said, she's a bit confused about the biological implications of a pathway having some genes that are upregulated and some that are downregulated. And yeah. why is it okay to determine whether a pathway is generally upregulated or downregulated based on the proportion of genes that are that are upregulated or downregulated? Um, um, is there weighting based on which genes are more important than others? Um, and I'm just going to add to the end there. What about what about negative feedback loops in pathways? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. Um, so a pathway, yeah. So when we do GACA, we you, we usually differentiate between upregulated genes and downregulated genes. And basically, if we have a pathway and reaching upregulated genes, if you look at the results, so it means that maybe one third, to be a realist, it's not 80%. I'd say if you have one third of your genes in the pathway that are upregulated, we say it's, the genes are upregulated. But what I don't say, I'd never say the pathway is upregulated or the pathway is activated because I know that it's only a portion of those genes that are upregulated. It's significant. It's more than random than chance. So something is going on, but I know that if I look down, uh, in the results in this pathway that is enriching upregulated genes, are, uh, I also have genes that are downregulated. And um, depending if it's a small pathway that is very specific or a larger pathway, sometimes you have different uh, branches of the pathway. And you can have three branches of this pathway that are, all the genes are up, and then one branch is that um, the genes are down. So, uh, some people, they prefer to rank the genes, but all the genes that are just differentially expressed do not differenti differentially expressed. And then you would just say your, your pathway is um, the enriched in genes that are altered in your model versus not altered. And then you, you don't, uh, at this point, you, you, you for you, for you, it doesn't matter if it's upregulated and downregulated because you think you, you don't know about um, about which branch is active an activator and when which branch is an inhibitor. So that's one way to answer the question. And then for the feedback loop, the only thing I can think, but that's very different. And sometimes when I do a, like a, we do a, a drug or even overexpression of a gene, and then the target pathway instead of being repressed as we thought it would be at the RNA level, it's expressed because it's a feedback loop. 
but then you you need to it's, it's nothing related to pathway enrichment res, results it's just related to 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 your model if you if you target a gene there is the cells is, go, is going to try to compensate so if you, if you try to target a pathway to inhibit the, the pathway you may have different different roads for that and then at the end your, your pathway that you you want it to be repressed is actually uh, enriching upregulated genes so i don't know if i answered the question i thought that was great thank you so much so uh going back to cytoscape uh so uh so basically we showed enrichment map but now what i'm trying to tell you is that cytoscape is very generic and you can do a network with uh, with a lot of types uh, of ideas in mind, and you all you also you can create your custom network with uh, no needs of apps. And this is what I'm showing here to you. And the advantage of creating a network in Cytoscape is that you can add different layers of information. So on this here, so we have like a a very small gene list. And uh, we have two types of information. One is the mutation and the, uh, the, 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 the number of mutation in the genes in my cohort of patients and the expression level of this gene. So I was able to add these two information in, on my network. And then uh, what I did is I put the node size proportional to the number of mutation and I put the knot color uh, proportional to uh, the expression uh, of those genes. So to the kind of information on one network and then the edges represent uh, it's another, um, another table that tells me which uh, protein of those uh, genes are known to physically interact with each other. So we were able to put three information on this uh, network. So why are, what, what are the advantages of network? But why? Uh, so networks are powerful tools to reduce complexity. They are more efficient than tables. They are great for data integration and uh, they represent an intuitive visualization. So uh, here on the right, this is an example that tried to illustrate this um, concept. So this new network was built in 2020, uh, representing the SARS-CoV-2 proteins. I think it's 26 out of 29. And they were uh, tagged and pulled down to detect uh, the human proteins that could physically uh, bind off, interact with them. So this network is what we call a protein-protein interaction network. And so they use different uh, visual styles to represent the different information. So they use the node shape here, the diamond and the color. So the diamond red nodes represent the source of two proteins and then the small round nodes represent the human proteins that in, that were interacting in their experiment with the source of two protein. So then uh, the edges represent this interaction. And if you have um, uh, a thick edge, it means that they, they think that the interaction was very strong because the human protein was uh, more, more abundant in their, in, in, in their uh, um, proteomics data that they got from their prudent essay. And then the additional uh, information is that where the node was orange is because the human protein was known to have a drug uh, that would can target these proteins. And the last one were that these yellow edges were the physical interaction between the human proteins. So at least they, I think they, they, they were able to put five information uh, on this network and maintain like a, a, a clear uh, image that we can uh, interpret and uh, understand. So uh, in Cytoscape you have, uh, once you have created your network, it can be like a hairball, um, it could be a bit messy, but then you have multiple tools in Cytoscape to manipulate your networks. And one uh, important is to play with the layout. So you play with different uh, layout algorithm so that would be a network before playing the, the the layout and then after the layout then you can see that your cluster are now uh, far away from each other so um so today we are focusing on, on enrichment analysis pathway enrichment analysis 
and uh, we are showing you the enrichment map this morning and then the React FI plugin this afternoon, but many other apps uh, exist. And uh, so you can go to the app store and then you can look at the categories and uh, you can look at the description of the apps to see uh, if there is one that can be suitable for your project. 